Good morning, everybody. Tom's our speaker today. Tom is an amazing product person who loves coaching teams to get unstuck. He's worked in design, user research, and marketing strategy. He's co-founded a web agency, and he's worked with startups and product innovators. Tom specializes in complexity theory and has coached multiple teams through the second product problem. His soon-to-be-released card deck on PIP deck on innovation tactics should be a really handy addition to your product toolkit. And his substack on product discovery, experimentation, and design should definitely be in your list if it isn't already. I'm going to pass over to Tom and get things started. Welcome, Tom. Amazing. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, real pleasure to be here. I'm excited today to share stuff that I'm working on for the last 20 years, really. But it's sort of a distillation, a remixing of loads of practices that I've tried, tested, failed, honed, fixed, all that sort of stuff in order to get to something that I found works and tested with a bunch of different teams. Now, I'm going to share my screen. And I am the sort of oddball who likes to work in Miro and share screen from Miro. So it's not a sort of polished deck that sort of flies out of PowerPoint with animations and things like that. We're going to scroll around Miro together and figure things out as we go. Broadly, today, we're talking about prioritization for rapid risk reduction. And I'm going to get into a little bit about what goes wrong with prioritization in general, and then how a couple of the techniques from the deck that Scott mentioned from the course I teach at Maven can unpick some of that and help us work in a different order that reduces risk, learn quickly, and deliver on time or early sometimes, which is the dream. And then we're going to have a quick practice of one of those tools. I'm going to get you guys in trying out the time machine for yourselves so you can take that back and use it with your teams. This is the single method workshop that I've found unlocks the most interest in discovery, in working in a different way, both with stakeholders and with people on the team, developers, designers, everyone likes this or everyone gets it. I don't know if they like it, but they get it once they've been through it. We're going to have a bit of time for Q&A and then I'll give you some clues of where to go next if you have more questions. Now, prioritization. There's two major forms of questions that I hear from product people about prioritization. Number one, which of these umpteen features should we build next? Number two, in which order should we work so we can deliver business value fast? How do we build things on time to budget, get the right things done, all that sort of stuff? Methods in the deck, in the course, they can be used for both. But actually today we're going to focus on the second one because that's where most product people spend most of their life. You've got stuff you need to deliver. You're supposed to be delivering business value, customer value, and you want to know how do we do this in the most effective order so we're not spinning our wheels, not gold plating, not under or overdoing it. And we're just getting it right. So our customers are happy and our stakeholders, team members, colleagues are happy. That's what we're focusing on today. So what goes wrong? The default that teams tend to be stuck in or get stuck in, I don't know if this is familiar to you. Some teams have moved past this, but a lot of teams are in this world. If we build it, they will come. And there is a plan. Someone's had an idea. The organization has agreed that this idea is worth doing. This feature set, this new product idea, whatever it might be. And there's a plan, a vague plan. We want a plan. We're going to start to lay out some designs. We're going to do some technical estimation. We're going to put a roadmap down, all that sort of stuff. And then we're going to start building. And then we're going to launch, obviously, and we're going to win. It's going to be amazing when we launch this thing. We just know it because the idea is so shiny and lovely. And then how that mostly goes is we start the build, looking fine. Yeah, we're getting on with it. And then something goes wrong. There's a delay. Some parts of it turned out to be more complicated than we hoped. And so there's a bit of a delay. And then it's going on so long that actually some of the team get pulled onto something else. And now there's the team has changed, which means there's more of a delay. Now it's sort of dragging. It's months over. People are getting stressed. And eventually we launch it. Hooray! And it's finally out. But we've kind of forgotten to check whether it actually worked or not, and whether it actually delivered any value. And that's still really uncertain, even after all of this effort. Quick comment, show of hands. Is that kind of like you've experienced, or is your place completely different? 
think I've got a real example. For many people, their life is ruled by the question, when will it be done? And meetings are in the, when will it be done? Well, we need to prioritize things so we get it done. But the product, the project which inspired Pivot Triggers and Time Machine that we're going to look at later was one from many years ago now, I think nine years ago now, when we knew right back here after two weeks of work that this thing was going to work out. And what happened was there was a there was a researcher, it wasn't me who was working on the team. The team had this plan, bit of technology, we're going to flip it around, we're going to launch this thing. It'll be really quick, it'll be great, we'll do it in a couple of months. And then there's clearly a real need in the market here. Team there, there was some technology, they wanted to flip it and release a new product. And the senior stakeholders were absolutely certain there was a gap in the market for this thing. Nobody seemed to be offering this. Fantastic, we can be the first on the market. Brilliant. So they started planning and building, laid out some designs. I'd already built a research function there. So they had a researcher who went off to find some customers that they could test the flow with and make sure it was all making sense, make sure it, it was usable. And he came back after a week or so saying, I can't actually find any customers for this. Is that a problem? Should we be thinking about something else? And the team said, no, no, go find some people. I'm sure you can find somebody, just find anybody. So we find a bunch of people who were adjacent. They were sort of in the right area. I think this product was about car financing and these people owned leased cars. And so he brought them in, tested the flow and the flow made sense to them. They could get through it, but all of them said, I would never want this. Why would you want this? This is nonsense. And the product didn't make any sense to them. They couldn't understand why anyone would want it. They also told him about a bunch of other problems that they had when it came to buying cars, leasing cars, finding cars. So we went back to the team. This is sort of two, three, four weeks in and said, I think we've got a problem. I, the people, nobody wants this thing. Are you sure we want to build this? Look, there are these five other ideas that people really do want, which we could build. It would probably take us a bit longer, but we could do that. And there's a real need for that in the market. But the team were on track. They had a plan. They were going to build the thing. They said, no, we need to build it. We need to find out for real. So they carried on. The two or three months this would take turned into six months, a bit of a death march project. After six months, it launched. Bottles of champagne, fanfare, everyone very happy. There was one customer who applied and he was declined in three months. And then they shut it down and said, oh, well, at least we learned. I wish we could have known earlier on that this wasn't going to work out and then we wouldn't have done it. Cue the, the illustrator, cue the researcher with the crying face emoji. So this sort of thing is what I labeled at the time a zombie initiative. It, we know it's not going to work. And there's this creeping sense of dread, a creeping sense that it isn't looking as good as it looked when it was a shiny idea when we were talking about it around the table. Now we're three months, six months into the project and we've built it and we've shown it to some people and the response is meh. Then we've got this creeping sense it's not going to work out. But it's really hard to do anything about that. And the reason is we've got sunk cost fallacy, sunk cost bias. I've got a load more slides about this. We could go into the details, of it, but basically it comes down to that sunk cost biased. We've put a load of work in. So now if we kill the project, it's on the head of the researcher. It was the researcher's fault. They killed the project. And it, all of that waste is now their fault. If we finish the project, at least we've finished it. We tick it off. We've shipped something. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's not our fault. And that's a real challenge for everyone. Now, quick question. What's the longest zombie initiative? that you've ever been involved with, something which was just dragging on. We've got Denise saying, yeah, almost a year of engineering development into it. Four months, not too bad. 14 months, yeah. Wondering if anyone's gonna go, oh, four years, yeah. That's probably the longest I've heard so far. There was someone, when I gave this talk to a bunch of people, someone was at the talk who'd been at the company when this zombie initiative was happening. And he said, oh, six months. I thought you were talking about the one I was on, which was two years. And it was just over and over again, this was happening. But yeah, probably a year and a half. It's pretty classic. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? That's the next thing. We're going to scroll all the way back to the left. 
And there's these two ideas that we're going to use. The first is time machine. We're going to go on to that in a minute. But if you've heard of the pre-mortem, an idea from Gary Klein, the time machine is a version of the pre-mortem. The twist is we're going to say we've got a plan, we've got a project. So as early in the project as you can, but it can be any time, ideally just before you're starting, when you have a bit of a plan, but not too much of a plan, you are going to sit down with your team and with your stakeholders and you're going to run this exercise where you say, right, we jump in a time machine. I make a big fanfare about this. I get them to imagine if they prefer the DeLorean or the TARDIS or the classic H.D. Wells time machine. But we're going to jump in and we're going to take a trip into the future. And it's going to be a few weeks or months after the project has finished. So we know the result by the time we step out of the time machine. We step out and it's gone better than anyone hoped. It's amazing. The, the project has worked incredibly well. And then we get everyone to write down what that world looks like on little stickies separately. And we're going to do a bit of clustering and we start to arrange those and make sense of everybody's hopes. But there we're getting the hopes. One thing you find that's interesting is often people's hopes are slightly different. We've all been talking about this project and we know it's going to be good, but we've all got different ideas about what good looks like. And we haven't had that conversation often. Most of the time, I've found. Then there's the twist. We then get back in the time machine and we're going to go to a parallel universe, a universe where the project went so badly that we wish we'd never started. And that's a key twist on the pre-mortem. Normally, it's about things have gone wrong, what went wrong, and people worry about the release problems and that the idea was good, but we released it badly. What we want to do is reframe that to the world where this is a world where it went so badly, we wish we'd never even started. We wish we'd never even heard of this idea. And then we get people to write down, what does that world look like? What went wrong? And what we're doing in that side is uncovering people's hidden fears. The fears of all the things that you are kind of secretly thinking are going to go wrong, but it's difficult to look your colleague in the eye and say that you think their idea is going to go wrong there's a real social sort of stigma there in a lot of teams. So that's basically the trick of the time machine. We do some clustering, we'll get there later. And then we are going to do some voting to see which of the potential future worlds is the scariest. What, which one, or sometimes several of these different things that could go wrong are the scariest to us. And we're looking at that across the whole team and the stakeholders. And we want to see, are people scared of different things or is everyone scared of the same thing? And then the key in terms of prioritization is we're starting with the scariest thing. That's where we start work. And the big sort of twist that we're going to make is the success of this project doesn't depend on choosing the right code base, doesn't depend on getting the designs perfect. There are many ways that it could work, but there are also many ways that it could fail. And so we're going to start by realizing our project's success depends on the behaviors of people and systems that are outside of our control. And we're going to start by trying to probe for those behaviors and do something small, rough, ragged, by hand, in order to provoke the world and see if we can see some of those behaviors before we build the whole thing. So that's often it's a sort of big item people like, how am I going to do that? But I suspect you're already sort of getting the sense of this. And if you've heard of the ideas of pre-totyping, sometimes people talk about fake doors, people talk about market fit, testing with a landing page before you buy something. These are all versions of ways that you can do a quick, rough probe of your big idea and get early signals in a small way before you move on to build the whole thing. So we start with the thing we're most afraid of, then we move on to the thing we're next most afraid of. And every time we probe and get signals back, we get to discover, is our fear founded? Was that fear correct? And it is going to go wrong in that way. And if it is, then we get to adapt the plan, which might mean we kill the project or it might mean we change something about the way we're doing it or we learn something that tells us, I ah, know we've got a better idea now. Or we learn that the fear didn't come true. It's actually all fine. 
and we can crack on without having that worry, that fear holding us back like an anchor. So those are the two things that happen after you've done the time machine. The other key idea is this pivot triggers. So once we've understood this is the thing we're afraid of, for example, customers don't want it, or we can't build it well enough, or the data is in a, a rubbish format and we can't make sense of it. We're get, then going to write down a pivot trigger before we start the probe. And this ties us. It says, we want to, before we start doing work, we don't want to get trapped in sunk cost bias. So we're going to set the threshold for what enough is before we start the work. Because if we wait until after we've done an experiment and then look backwards, we're going to justify it. And we're going to be able to get away and go, oh, yeah, it wasn't very much, but it's enough. It's fine. No, what we want to do is say, before we begin this, we are going to set the level of signal that's enough for us to say, yep, keep going. And if it's underneath that, then we're going to have to contend with that. So these are some real examples. And the general format you can see at the top, we're going to agree what behavior is important to see in order to allay our fears. And we're going to set a date really soon when we're going to see that behavior by the end of this week, the end of next week, sometimes even today. And we're going to agree a tiny rough version of our idea, of part of our idea, which we can put out in that time to get those signals. Here's a real example I've got here, which was there was a team who were working with recruiters. Recruiters are busy people. And one of the things they have to do is arrange to chat with candidates. And we noticed from the data in the system, they were taking longer than was ideal to arrange to chat with candidates. And the team thought, oh, my God, I bet they're doing that email tennis back and forth, trying to book sessions to chat with people. What we're going to do instead is that they should be using Calendly. It's obvious that they should use something like Calendly. And we could build an integration so they could have Calendly triggering automatically from our recruitment system. That's going to be amazing. So what we did was send out an email to 10 different customers saying, we're offering you a free Calendly instance and integration. We'll do all the work for you. You'll have Calendly. Here's what Calendly does. Really good. It's going to save you loads of time uh, when you're booking cal uh, candidate interviews. And the team were bullish. They said, actually, we reckon six out of 10 people that we send this to are going to come back to us and say, yep, yeah, absolutely. Like this is free Calendly integrated for free, saving you hours of time every week. Who's not going to say yes? I'll tell you who's not going to say yes. All 10 people. None of them were interested. One was interested after the team twisted their arm. And then when we went to actually help them get Calendly integrated, it was a nightmare. It didn't work and they didn't use it. So this brilliant idea was able to be killed in about two days of sending some emails and having a chat. And it saved us. This is the beauty. This saved us from three months of integration. So prioritization, pulling back to the prioritization thing, in that case, the biggest fear that the team had was maybe people won't want Calendly integration. And so we tested that and we learned, yeah, actually they didn't. So we saved ourselves so much time that we could have wasted building the whole feature only to throw it away. Another example, this is a real example, which is more on the system side, a system that whose behavior is outside of your control. This was a team who wanted to use data about different customers in order to make an insights dashboard. And they realized one of the things that was really scary was, what if we access that data and we can't really use it? What if we're going to need to clean it up extensively before we can do anything with it? We don't have the time for that. That's going to make the project not worth it for us. So it's a really quick thing to do. Just go and grab a sample from 20 different customers, big enough sample to get a reasonable idea and just read through it and check, is the data okay? And the team agreed, if it's more than 25% of the data, then we're going to need to pivot. We're going to need to change our plan because our plans depend on the data being better than that. So there's a couple of ideas of pivot triggers. At this point, any questions or comments? I'm aware I've just loaded a lot of information in a short space of time. Not seeing any in the chat. So we're going to jump on 
and we're going to do a little time machine exercise. So we've got 56 participants. I'm going to share the link to this board and we're going to see how we go. So we've got a link to this board, which means you'll have access to this board afterwards if you would like to. Um, what I'm going to do is make us a bunch of time machine instances here. And then I'd like you, let's see if this will work. We want about four people around each board. So when you're in, you should be able to see each other's cursors. So I'm going to hope that if you all put your cursor near a board, we'll then be able to see when there are four or five people at each at each one. And if there's too many, move to another one. Cool. Looking good. You should be able to see on the big board here, we've got a load of people's cursors over here. If you need to orient yourself in Miro, if it's new for you, don't worry. It's not too hard. In the top right, you see my face there. Find my face and click on it and you'll see the view that I'm then seeing. It'll give you that view. Or if you want to zoom in and out, there's zoom controls in the bottom right hand corner. Or you can use your scroll wheel to scroll in and out as well on your mouse or your scroll pad. You move around. And then the other thing you need to know is you've got these tools down the left. And that gives you the access to, to make sticky notes. But there are already sticky notes there. So what we're going to do is move over here. And you're going to find there's a bunch of yellow stickies. There's going to be some coordination to do in each group. This is looking good. But this is good. We're all basically ready. We're going to do the fun one that I always do. So moving home. Everybody knows about moving home. We're going to imagine that you are embarking on the project of moving home. That's what you're about to do. And so what we're going to do is first moving home. That's our initiative. We step into the time machine and we go on a little journey to the future. And when we arrive, you open the doors, the mist clears, and it is three months after you've finished moving home. And it's gone brilliantly. It's better than you ever hoped it could be. What does this world look like? Why is it so good? Why are you so happy? So you're going to grab a set of post-its each. There should be four sets here. If you need to, if there's more of you, just grab a set, copy it, make yourself some post-its. So you just need a set of yellow post-its each. And if hoping that everyone's got a set of post-its, I'm going to set a timer for two minutes. We're going to do this fairly quick and loose. Two minutes. And you are just going to write down what is so good in this world. We've stepped out the time machine. It's two or three months after we finished moving home and it's gone brilliantly. We're absolutely delighted. Why are you so happy? What's great about this world? That's it. On the yellow stickies, just add your thoughts. Why are you so happy? So really important here that you are really imagining yourself in that future. It has happened and it's great. Why are you happy? Ooh, finishing off. This is looking good. Okay, so I'm going to get you all to stay in your view. So stay in Miro wherever you are, but I'm going to work on this section. So what we're going to do next is someone who's comfortable in Miro, take the stickies that don't have anything written on and just drag them out of the way for now. And you're going to cluster together all of the stickies that have got something written on into a rough clump. So you've got a, a cluster of the ones with writing on, and they're just in a jumble at this point. And then what we're going to do is read through the stickies that are there and spot any that theme together, that feel like, yeah, they go together. And when you find two that feel like they go together, grab them and drag them over to the right. So you stack them up above one of the green stickies over on the right. So then as you find these clusters that go together, stack them up vertically above the green stickies. And then in the green sticky, you're going to write a summary, a kind of a, what is the theme all about? So for this one, for example, we've got light. And for this one, it's near work. Maybe we could just say close to work. So you'll all have very similar things. We've got started there. 
So keep going. That's it. So one thing that I've noticed is there are different ways of clustering these things. And sometimes we can have a good discussion about it, but here we're just going to do it silently. There is no right answer. You get to cluster these things as makes sense for you and your team, and you get to name them in ways that make sense for you and your team. Often we'll do some clustering, and then as we're naming the sections, we'll realize, ah, okay, actually this was two separate things, and we can break them apart, move the clusters around. Or sometimes we'll realize that two, two sets we thought were different are actually a bit more similar, and we'll put them together and give it a big picture. There's no one right way to do this. There we go. So we've got some lovely themes emerging. I think everyone has got something happening. Yep. Don't overthink it. Just stick in some themes. And when you're ready to move on, we can do the next chunk. So for this, you're going to need some more yellow stickies over on the left. So copy, paste, set up a new a new batch of yellow stickies on the left for your team. And now you already know what's coming. We get back in the time machine. And this time, and it goes all wibbly wobbly, you know, TV effects. This time though, when the door opens and the mist clears, it's the same date as before, but we're in a parallel universe. And in this universe, the home move went so badly, we wish we'd never even started. What's that like? What went wrong? Why is it so terrible? Two minutes again, let's write. Now picture yourself, you're there, you're in this home and you are miserable. What went wrong? You're on the phone to your partner, your parents, your friends, whoever it is, you're on the phone complaining. What are you saying? Why, why are you so miffed? You wake up every morning, just dreading the day because you're in this home and it's awful. Why is it so bad? Or maybe the problem with the home move was it never happened. You never completed it. You're in limbo. Lovely. Last few seconds. Finish writing up your post-its. And we're going to now do the same thing we did before. So we're going to grab all of the stickies with writing on, cluster them together in a big bundle, pull the other ones out of the way. Now we're going to cluster these underneath the orange stickies on the right. So a little bit like the stacks above the green, we're going to stack below the orange ones. However is comfortable for you and your team, quietly just clustering and moving, feel free to rearrange them until it feels about right. And then we're going to also name those orange clusters or the orange stickies with the cluster themes. It's interesting in terms of theming here, Annoying neighbours and noisy road, theming with no nearby stores or an expensive supermarket. And to me, those feel quite different problems. You could break them down in different ways. So I'm interested to see how you're thinking about that. Especially when we I'll give you a hint about what's coming next, we're actually going to start pairing up the orange and the green themes. So I already know that there's a light theme in the green stickies. So I'd imagine that there'd be a, a dark or a no light theme in the orange stickies. And yet here we've got no sunlight and no parking space. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how they go together, but maybe they do. And this is the thing, it depends on you and your team, how you think about the world. We're just making sense of our hopes and fears. There we go. And then as you start to find these clusters and name them, what you can then start to do when you're ready is drag any that match so that they're near their green counterparts. So what we're going to end up creating is a sort of these two worlds, the, the wonderful world and the terrible world in all of these different aspects that we might care about. One of the fun bits of all of these sorts of exercises is getting the framing right in the first place and making sure your team is all on the page about what the initiative even is that we're doing. I'll tell you that there's one little trick that I sometimes do before we start the time machine, which is to get everybody to describe the initiative on a post-it note in their own words. 
It's a good way to warm up your Miro skills and just check that everybody understands yeah. what we're working on together. And you often see a lot of variation in that and a lot of misunderstandings that give us clues in that as well. But that's my bad for not explaining it clearly enough. Cool. So we've got some pairings and clusters coming. Now, sometimes you'll find that there's an orange sticky for which there's no good green pair. That's fine. You can just put it next to an empty green sticky. Sometimes you'll find there's a green sticky with no good orange pair. That's also fine. What we can then do is add in that sticky and just write down what the opposite would be. So here we've got good placement or location. So this would be bad location. That's an interesting one there in that location, it breaks down into a few things. There's something about your immediate surroundings. And if there's, we've got here with no nearby stores, but there's also friendly neighbors. And so neighbors you could separate out from amenities, say. There's also location in terms of commute. So th those things, you might treat them separately or you might treat them the same, depending on what you're working on and how you're thinking at the time. But there we go. We don't need to worry about this too much. Now, there's an interesting thing. As you look at your board, I bet you'll start to see that some of the themes you've got there are relatively under your control. They're things that you have a relatively large amount of influence over. You can go and look at the house before you move in and check that the windows are big and check that there's lots of light. Those sorts of things you can relatively have control over. But some of the things like you move somewhere for a job and then you get laid off, that's not directly in our control. As you read through these pairs, Feel, as you read these orange ones, which of those feel the scariest for you? And what we're going to do is take a very quick vote. So I'm going to give everyone two votes and one minute. I'm going to trust that everybody knows you're voting on the orange sticky, not anything else. So pick two of the orange stickies and you're going to vote on those. You've got a minute to vote. But the two orange stickies that feel the scariest when you read them. And that feeling the scariest, it's plausible and it would also be really bad. Those are the sort of aspects for it. But just trust your gut. What feels the scariest? Oh, we're blistering through. This is going to be chaos. I'm going to end the voting session. So some of you didn't get to do all your votes. But now it's going to show us this, which will be absolute nonsense. But if we pull up that voting session again and look at the results, you should now be able to see what got votes. And these are the things that you, your group are the most scared of. And it's interesting. I think it's always like this. There's always quite a big spread. Different people are scared of different things. That is the same as will be happening on your project. So different people on your team and your stakeholders are going to have different big fears. And it's really valuable for you as a product person, as a designer who's helping, as a researcher, whatever your role is, it's really valuable for you to understand what other people are scared of. Because then you can prioritize your work in order to check the biggest fears that people have. We've done the time machine. That is the way it goes. That's the steps. And you can do this with your team, any initiative you want to. A little bit more information here. I'm going to close the voting. So you're losing your votes. But really, the pre-mortem framing makes it safe and even desirable to share concerns and criticism about an idea, where it often isn't safe to go, I think this idea is stupid. In this way, we already know when we go to the bad world that it has failed. So you're just saying why it failed. And human brains are brilliant at doing that. So we can use that. There's some more resources here if you want to find out more. There are also some do's and don'ts that I've shared here. Again, I'd say this board is open for you to read later. I want to leave some time for questions, if that's okay. So we'll jump over to the Q&A next. If anybody has any questions for Tom on this method or approach or things that he shared today, I'd love to hear them. Tom, I'm going to ask one really quick one, maybe just why we wait for people to come off the mural board and over. Curious on the culture of the permission to fail and the safety to fail. 
And do you find that in one part, maybe if teams don't have it, that a process like this can help break that down, but also yes. if they don't have it and they enter a process of this type, have you run into situations maybe where they're unsure of how to even go through this exercise because of that lack of safety or lack of permission? Absolutely. This exercise takes some practice and it's not going to change things overnight, but it is, I think, fair to say the only thing I've found that that cracks open the door to the ability to work in a different way. So I've done this now dozens of times and often with senior stakeholders, you'll see it in their eyes during this exercise is the first time they've even allowed themselves to consciously consider that this might fail. And that's the magic. You are then taking to that world and they suddenly it's not just people complaining like the older research and designers they're always complaining oh, the developers are always complaining about technical debt just ignore them when will it be done but this has got to get done so it cracks open the door and suddenly you know what it is that they are scared of they've put their vote in as well they've put their post-its in as well they've seen what everyone else is scared of it gets it out in the open and then you can start to to have those discussions. And I've seen it go like, oh yeah, we better actually do some research. Mm-hmm. We'd better actually test this offering. Of course, before I did this time machine, it would be no way. We don't have time for testing. We don't have time to go and do your fake door tests. We've just got to build it. And after we've done the time machine, it opens that door and people get a little bit more interested. Mm-hmm. Question here. Do you typically include commercial team stakeholders as well? Or is it more like just that technical cross-functional team. Cool. So you want definitely the team who are going to do the work. So your technical cross-functional team, of course. But yes, include other stakeholders as much as you can. As you see, to do this is relatively quick. You can blast through this in half an hour, 45 minutes, if you're going at it. Or you can take a bit longer if you want to pad it out. But really neat, efficient way to get really deep involvement from commercial team from senior stakeholders if you can get like real c-level people involved too fantastic but anyone who's sponsoring the idea the person whose idea it is get them in there as well you can then do the rest of the work with your technical team but then you'll know more about the shape of the product the shape of the project rather and where people's fears most are absolutely you can copy the board as you saw like it's really simple it's just a block a line some green and orange post-its and some yellow post-its. There's also Innovator's Cheat Sheet I've put together, but this technique, Time Machine, and then it's the answer to what next? How do you begin to test or de-risk it when you have this sort of situation? And it breaks that down the next steps you go after this, because that's always the question you get. Time Machine, and then people are like, so now what? Mm. And Mm -hmm. that also answers your question about the prioritization. The way you're going to prioritize is instead of thinking impact, effort, and trying to imagine the future, predict things that you cannot predict. Instead, start with what is real for you right now, which is what you're afraid of. And start with the thing you're most afraid of. Because as I said at the start, if you go out there and you find that fear is justified, great. You've done that quickly and you've got time to change your plan. You've got time to adapt. You've got time to kill this idea and do a better one or find a way to make it work. This is a win for everybody. And if you go out there and you find that your fear is not founded and actually customers are biting your hand off about this, fantastic. Now no one's afraid of that anymore. Now you've got real evidence from the world that says, brilliant, let's go, let's do this. And you've got the confidence to go and do the next step. So you go back and you do the time machine again, or you pick the next biggest fear on the time machine and you probe for that. And that's how you prioritize your work from the time machine. Question here, how difficult, sorry, is it to accept that it might fail? Because you're building this product yourself, how do you prepare yourself to critique the idea? Now, that is when it comes, that's when you need to set your pivot triggers. So if you want more on that sort of front, again, pivot triggers are in the Innovators Cheat Sheet, and there's a load of writing I've done about them. There's other stuff. There's loads of stuff out there that I've now shared with the world. But there's also Annie Duke's book, Quit, gets into why this is so hard. Why is it so hard to kill something, to come to terms with the fact that our 
beloved baby we've been working on is not going to work. And this has happened throughout history. There are countless examples of this. I'm sure we've all gone through this as well. And there's two sides to it. One is we get started with something and then we can't accept that it's failing and we carry on too long. The other, which is even sadder, I think, is we have a great idea, but we never get started with it because we're afraid. And the inertia works in both directions. Mm -hmm. And so this starting with the fear, doing a tiny probe in an hour or a day or something like that, just to get some really small early signals that give us confidence either to stop or to start or to keep going, it's that's going to help us to make progress. So I use this all the time. I use yeah. this for my own stuff. And I wouldn't have started teaching the course about it or put this stuff out there if I hadn't tested it with pivot triggers first. Maybe time for one more question. How do we use this pre-mortem technique for prioritizing many ideas? So that is when we get into a different whole world. And there's a whole load of other stuff in the card deck about that. But if you're choosing between many different ideas, it's actually a different, I wouldn't use the time machine. The time machine is for when you have, you've got an idea and now you're figuring out how do we build this one. There's a whole load of stuff about doing multiple pitch provocations. So getting a whole range of ideas, trying to make them as diverse as possible and then get people to sift through them and then put multiple want it enough signal generators out into the world. So put landing pages out there for all 10, all 20 different ideas and see which of them get, get the most traction. Yeah. But that's a, I could do another whole talk about that if you want. Yeah. I'm sure we could probably dive into a much deeper <laughs> workshop that we can get into in an hour with you on this topic. As you mentioned, it's a course. There's lots of other resources out there. Jack had a question here about where this innovation cheat sheet is that you've referred to a couple of times. There's a link here. You should be able to put your name into the thing, add your email address, and it will send you a link or send you the PDF. There's a PDF, and it's got five techniques in it, which is time machine. There's multiverse mapping, which helps you get more detailed about the behaviors you need to see in the different worlds in your time machine. Then there's pivot triggers. How do we set our signals that we need to see what's enough of a signal to make us feel confident? There's behavioral probes, a whole range of different ideas for how you can then go and probe in a really lightweight way. And you can use one of them or mix them together. And there's something about how do we make sense of the signals that are coming back and tell better stories. So we give us more options and decide what to do next. That's great. Really thanks a ton, Tom. I think it's a lot of fun. Again, like great to get through some of these things. I know people might be looking for the links, maybe you didn't get a chance to grab them. We'll have those available within our recap topic afterwards on the site. And so if you need to access any of those things, look for that recap to be posted later today. I think with that, we can kind of start wrapping stuff up, be mindful of people's time. I know they have a lot of people got to get back to their next meetings and stuff like that. So just again, encourage people to continue the conversation. If there's questions you've got around this, things that you want to share, maybe stuff that's working in your own practices, feel free to start a conversation in the community. We'd love to hear from you on that side. We have lots of other community events coming up next week. We're speaking with Mark Rennie the week after with Greg Bernstein and lots of other events coming up as well. So feel free to check out our full calendar. Our big one definitely coming up is our mini conference at the end of May, early June. This is three days, two hours each day, 12 different speakers, a really fantastic, diverse representation of people and really encourage you to get involved and come out for these. These are a really fun event and a really great way to learn a lot of great stuff about how to supercharge your product team. If you want to get involved as a speaker, put up your hand like Tom here and share some of your wisdom and experience. You can learn more about how to do that by searching for speak within our community. And with that, I think we will wrap up. And Tom, thank you very much. It was really energetic, tons of fun. I hope we woke up a few people on the West Coast, you know, had to be here early <laughs> and got a few people early, early guys at the end of their day in the UK and Europe on that side. So yeah, really appreciate it. Tons of fun and uh, really great to see you and have some of that uh, experience shared today. Uh, thank you so much and everyone here for thank you for having me and thanks everyone for getting stuck in getting engaged with the exercise and asking really great questions do hit me up on social media let me know if you do try the time machine i love hearing stories about it awesome thanks again tom you take cool. care cheers